Dearest of citizens, I bid you all a warm greeting on this most exalted of days. Throughout our long and troubled history, mankind has been at odds with the untold legions of aliens, mutants, and heretics who would seek to topple our glorious imperium and to revel under the light of the stars, which the Emperor so rightfully conquered in the name of humanity. But with that being said, there is a threat which exists outside of our realm of reality, which has taken the place as our species' eternal and definitive rival. I would, of course, be referring to the malign demons of the warp. These hellspawn have existed since time immemorial, where the first emotional outbursts and indulgences of our ancient ancestors formed the primordial energies which gave birth to the very chaos gods themselves. As the ages passed, the immaterial lords have only grown stronger and more powerful to the point where the four gods have been poised to rip reality asunder and to plunge the entire galaxy into the tumultuous swirling tempest of the warp from where the souls of every mortal man, woman and child will be torn from their bodies as a succulent treat for the ravenous demons. But there is a light against this darkest of nights. In the waning days of the Horus heresy, the Emperor knew that the dangers posed by chaos would be an existential threat for all of time. And so he tasked his most trusted advisor, Malkador the Sigilite, with forging a final bastion against the demon kin. With his new mission, he embarked on a galaxy-spanning search for individuals who could serve in this new task force. And once his agents were assembled, he created the foundations for the Grey Knights. This was to be a mysterious chapter of the noble Adeptus Astartes, who would be kept as a shrouded secret to almost the entirety of the Imperium. Most citizens should never be cursed with knowing of the warp's true existence, and so their meek and humble minds should be shielded from the knowledge of there being a task force which exists purely to repel these otherworldly mobs. In any case, as they stand today, the Grey Knights have been meticulously chosen and trained into becoming the ultimate hunters of all things demonic, and they have truly mastered the art of banishing any foul beasts which have slithered out from the nightmare of the warp. Being equipped with some of the finest of war gear, which has been tailor-made to best suit their sacred duties, they are the final avenging light to appear when the darkness of the Immaterium pervades and occludes all else within our galaxy. With their holy purpose in mind, today's sermon shall be focused not so much on the knights themselves, but on their home. We shall be exploring their great fortress monastery, found upon the distant moon of Titan within the ever-so-guarded Sol system. I will start by giving an overview of their mighty citadel before we delve into its depths to learn of the strange and arcane facilities which the Grey Knights have at their disposal. But without further ado, let us take our first steps upon Titan. Nestled around the colossal bosom of our own gaseous giant of Saturn, we will find the humble and unassuming moon of Titan. During the ancient age of strife, long before humanity existed as the unified imperium which we know it as today, there was an independently governed enclave of man which ruled over Saturn and its moons, and it was known as the Saturnine Ordo. With the conclusion of the Old Knight and with the emergence of the God Emperor, the various factions of the Sol system were quickly contacted and united into the fledgling form of the Imperium, with the great Saturnine fleet being absorbed into the Imperial Navy as a semi-autonomous military force. In any case, 
the previous polity of Saturn had built up a considerable foundation of logistical centers, military installments, and supportive foundations located around the various strategic locations of the moon. This meant that when the young Imperium first took the reins of leadership, that Titan was already in a tremendous state to be further developed into a true bastion of the Sol system. But to turn this icy ball of rock into a traditional military base was not to be the direction which the Emperor foresaw. Knowing of the horrors of the Immaterium in his magnanimous grace, he ordained for the formation of a new chapter of space marines who could repel the ever-gnawing forces of the warp and protect humanity for the rest of its tumultuous history. His most trusted advisor and friend, Malkador the Sigilite, was therefore tasked with bringing this new cadre into being, and so he turned his eyes to the opportune moon of Titan, which would become the new home of this righteous chapter. The final chosen location for this new fortress was to be in the shadow of Mount Anarch, and so a great excavation project was overseen to hollow out a vast enough cavern to house this new citadel. Whilst its construction was kept as a most closely guarded secret, the highly astute administratum scribe known as Catanoa Tallery was bright enough to learn of the project, resulting in a confrontation between her and Malkador. She initially believed this to be but a plot orchestrated by Horus to bring about the downfall of the soul system. However, it was through the actions of Nathaniel Garrow who convinced Malkador to forgive her for overstepping and intruding upon this secretive mission. Seeing great promise in the young scribe, he assigned her to work as the Curator Adepta Primus for this construction project, where she was to oversee a large portion of the planning and logistical work for completing the Great Citadel. In any case, after a truly enormous undertaking, the colossal fortress monastery of Titan was finally finished. Though the vast majority of it was concealed under the titanic ice sheets and liquid methane oceans, there was still a great black spire which pierced upwards, grasping out towards the void of night like a jagged knife aimed at the stars themselves. Descending into the depths of the fortress, one may be surprised at the eerie silence which seems to permeate every hall and chamber. Though it is a truly vast and labyrinthine base, it would be near impossible to find an individual who is not fully engrossed within their laborious duties. The great halls and corridors outstretch from each facility, connecting the various rooms in an esoteric lattice formation, almost certainly to produce some form of runic warding against the forces of the warp. To walk through these passageways you will bear witness to the entire history of the Grey Knights, told through the glorious tapestries, reliefs and artworks which adorn every available space upon the walls. Great carvings of the chapter's heroes will jut outwards, standing as an ever-preserved memory of a true martyr who died banishing the foulest of mankind's eternal enemies. In addition to the individuals of this chapter, their noble heraldic symbols and icons will also be placed in prominent display, inspiring some semblance of duty to those who walk these halls. Though quiet, these corridors are by no means abandoned to be witnessed by only the statues and paintings. Scribes, acolytes and scholars will carefully tread the sacred paths, constantly moving towards fulfilling another of their most precious of duties, all in the name of their patron chapter. It would be a most rare sight to see an actual grey knight striding through these passages, since most often they will be found within their own chambers, reflecting on the great mysteries of the warp, or simply to train and further refine their majestic skills of battle. 
Many rooms will be dedicated towards simple prayer or meditation, but they will similarly be adorned with the most grandiose of ornaments towards their chapter's glory. Statues of the Emperor himself and of their founding Lord Malkador will grace these private chambers, and it is here that a paladin may spend many hours deeply contemplating the best methods for banishing the foul incursions of the Neverborn. In addition to the truly awe-inspiring sights of this citadel, as you walk through its halls, you will be enshrouded by the pungent smell of incense wafting out from affixed wall scones and from acolytes who have been tasked with endlessly patrolling the great facility with their sacred senses. The various herbs and oils which are burnt here are not simply to bring a sense of refinement to the archaic halls, and it is actually to serve a most vital purpose to the knights. Much of the incense, combined with the near-silent prayers of the acolytes, will produce a mild warding against the forces of the warp, and so it acts as an additional deterrent against the immaterial hellspawn from ever intruding within this magnanimous fortress. In any case, one could become lost in simply traversing the halls, for the degree of stonework and historical storytelling to be found upon their walls is nothing short of captivating. But for the knights and acolytes, they rarely have time to sit and bask in reverence towards these masterpieces, for they have duties to perform deep within the depths of the fortress. As I have previously stated, much of the fortress monastery will be near silent, aside from the hurried footsteps and hushed prayers of humble servants. With that being said, however, there is a region of the citadel which is awash with the hustle and bustle of action, and this would be found in the Chamber of Trials. To put things simply, this would be where the Grey Knights train and refine their initiate members until they are in a position where they may join a strike force and set out to banish the demon kin. The recruitment process for this chapter is rather different from that of the other Astartes across the galaxy. For a typical chapter, perhaps the Blood Ravens, for instance, they will draw their recruits from a few selected worlds, and so every member of their chapter will hold a common lineage to their own system. For the Grey Knights, however, they are under no such restrictions when it comes to their aspirant members. For you see, it is not the world which is important to the Knights, Instead, it is the character of the initiate, and so they will search the entire galaxy just to find the most capable and able-bodied of men to join in their ranks. The arduous task of locating these chosen few is no small feat, and it falls to some of the most trusted of knights to carry out. There is a group within their chapter who go by the name of the Gatherers, and it is their duty to set out into the stars to locate those who may hold a strong enough fortitude to don the silver suits of power armor. These gatherers are grey knights themselves. However, after years of experience, not all can emerge unscathed from the horrors of war. Those who have become grievously injured or are simply incapable of striding into battle once more will be withdrawn from their combat roles, being tasked with secondary missions, such as with tactical planning, or in this case, recruitment. The gatherers will spend untold years sailing the stars, delving into the depths of the most violent of hive cities or feral worlds where one must be strong enough to even survive past childhood. Sometimes these knights will choose to board the dreaded black ships of the Inquisition, where they will sort through the psychic dregs destined to die beneath the Golden Throne, as sometimes one might be found to possess the vital psionic skills necessary to join in with the ranks of the knights. Other times, a gatherer may visit the fortress monasteries of other space marine chapters, where they will assess the already screened aspirants for members who may be more suitable for their own chapter. 
In these cases, the chapter master will almost always accept the request, as it is a sign of great honor to have the Grey Knights see your recruits as being worthy enough to join in their most sacred of ranks. In any case, once an aspirant has been chosen, they will be brought back to Titan, and it is in the Chamber of Trials where their destiny awaits. Within its hallowed halls, perhaps the most treacherous and formidable of training regiments will be well underway. If thousands of potential recruits are shuttled in from a far-off world, it is doubtful that even one of them will have the mental and physical fortitude to survive the first of the back-breaking trials which are soon to come. But this is utterly necessary for the Grey Knights. If you are successful in passing this stage, then you are to be blessed with the gift of the Emperor's own gene seed. And this gift is simply too precious and too sacred to be handed out to any but the finest and most capable of warriors. The actual contents of the Grey Knights training regiment is a closely held secret to their chapter, and so we can only speculate as to what transpires during their trials, but we can piece together some scant records as to what an initiate may be forced to endure. Firstly, aspirants will have to make a pilgrimage across the surface of the great Xanadu Regio, which is an incredibly hostile area found in the southern hemisphere of Titan. Many will simply keel over and succumb to the harsh environment, but for those who survive, they must endure an expedition through the pitch-black caverns underneath Ganesa Macula, which have become littered with the abandoned bones of those who failed to withstand the oppressive enclosure. But if one proves themselves as being capable enough to suffer through these trials of fortitude, then perhaps they will be able to stand fast against the future tests of the knights. Thousands of brutal combat scenarios will be enacted, with immense tests of psionic ability being carried out by the most sensitive of gatherers, who will assess whether or not these aspirants do indeed hold a strong enough character to withstand their expected duties. Once a recruit has defied the odds and survived the long trials, then it will be time for them to ascend as a grey knight. In the lowest depths of the chamber, there exists an expansive medical facility, replete with the finest of surgical equipment sourced from Holy Terror itself. Here, the legions of servitors will begin the process of transforming the humble human into a fully-fledged Astartes. The Emperor's own gene seed will be imbued within him, and the various physiological changes will commence until he stands as a man above all others. But this is not the end of his trial. At this point he will be named as a neophyte, and his training can now proceed with earnest. Paladins will train them in battle, librarians will refine their psychic skills, and brother captains will teach them the creed and duty of the Grey Knights with a great emphasis on their role as the final bastion against all things demonic. It is only here, at the end of their long training, that they will be expected to pass through the many rituals of detestation which have been formulated to steal one's soul against the inevitable temptations of chaos. To wield the powers of the warp is to invite the whispering lull of demons who would so readily drag you to damnation just for a single taste of your succulent soul. But it is only those of a weaker stock who would fall to the predation of the warp spawn, and for this chapter there can be no mercy given to those who would consort with demons. Once they have succeeded in this final of trials, then the neophyte will be permitted to rise, no longer as an initiate, but as a fully-fledged member of the Grey Knights. There is an ancient legend regarding the great citadel of Titan. Some scholars and learned members of the chapter have told of a tale most dark, which has given rise to many suspicions around the true reasons as to why Malkador chose this moon to house the fortress of his task force.
They say that beneath Mount Anarch, where the first foundations of this monastery were formed, that there lies a great and terrible evil which can never be permitted to gain freedom from its shrouded tomb. As I suggested, perhaps Malkador wanted to utilise this strange adversarial force to somehow empower his burgeoning chapter. Alternatively, maybe the fortress monastery was placed here because only an army as potent as the Grey Knights could be trusted to keep this evil contained and locked away from the rest of the Imperium. A third, far more sinister theory reads that Titan may have been completely safe when it was first chosen, and yet during its time where it was plunged into the warp, that a terrible beast managed to slither its way into the bowels of the moon, and that it has lurked there ever since, where it simply waits for an opportunity to rise and break free from its hidden nest. We may speculate endlessly, but we would simply be throwing words into the void. There is a truth to this quandary, but it is to be known by only the supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights himself. Within the hallowed book known as the Iron Grimoire, the entire founding tale of their chapter has been inked to paper, and the true secrets of this strange beast are said to reside within its ancient pages. Unfortunately, we will never be permitted to know of these secrets. No Grand Master has ever divulged the contents of this tome to any within their own chapter, and so it would be utterly unthinkable for him to ever consider sharing it with outsiders, such as ourselves. In any case, we have still learned of how the Grey Knights respond to this strange creature, and it may provide us with some evidence as to its true nature. Deep within the great citadel, at its lowest level, we will find the Chambers of Purity. Some within the chapter have compared the fortress monastery to being naught but a capstone of a tomb. But from this we must ask the most forbidden question, what has been put to rest in this cursed vault? Though we cannot say for sure of what exists beneath the citadel, we do know that the Grey Knights do not leave it undefended. Within the Chambers of Purity, we will find the elite brotherhood of the Purifiers. They have risen to a state where they completely and utterly exemplify the mission of keeping the galaxy as a pure sanctum against the demon kin, and rest assured there are none within the chapter who could be more trusted to carry out their vital mission. The purifiers have been tasked with standing vigil over the depths of their fortress, although their exact objective is kept as a heavily shrouded mystery. The brother captains and grand masters are not privy to their goals, and so it is only the members of the brotherhood themselves who know of that which they keep at bay. In any case, estranged rumours from loquacious scribes and acolytes have suggested that this region of the fortress is utterly haunted. They tell of ghosts and spirits which dance and lash out at any mortal beings who stray too far from the holy reliquaries and censers. The actual nature of these ghostly figures is almost entirely unknown, although it is speculated that it is the departed spirits of the enemies of man who attempt to pull their way into reality from within this dark chamber. It would then make sense that the purifiers would be ordered to purge and expunge these errant spirits from existence and to prevent them from ever being able to escape and find refuge out in the depths of the galaxy. This point, however, brings us back to the question of the strange being which slumbers beneath Titan. Perhaps this is a warp-born creature which has given rise to the ghostly phenomenon, or perhaps it is some form of psionic monstrosity which can simply conjure up the stolen memories of our foes to endlessly torment our forces. Whatever the true reason, the Grey Knights seem powerless to utterly banish it, 
and so they must compromise by containing its nightmarish projections and by ensuring that it may never be permitted to escape, for who knows of what terrors it could possibly unleash within the endless depths of space. An important point to note here is that the Chamber of Purity is not only the home to the purifiers, nor of the ghostly apparitions which they face. Within this deepest of chambers, we will find the tomb of Malkador the Sigilite, which is said to contain the ashen remains of his corpse, which so painfully fell from atop the golden throne in the climactic final hour of the Horus Heresy. It is not uncommon for knights to descend to this secluded monument to pay their respects or to simply sit in quiet meditation, reflecting on the actions of this heroic martyr and of how they can best exemplify his teachings by banishing the unending legions of the warp. But within the room which houses his tomb, there is another relic, and it is one which can never fall into the hands of any but the Grey Knights themselves. Held in but a simple wooden box, adorned with naught but a golden seal, we will find an ancient scroll named as the Terminus Decree. The existence of this artifact is perhaps the most closely guarded secret in the entire Imperium, for there are none but the supreme grandmasters of the Grey Knights themselves who know of its existence. All others who were involved in the creation of this scroll have long since died or vanished under such mysterious circumstances that we may safely presume that they will never again return to our plane of reality. Furthermore, there is not a single librarium or scholarium in which we have found any record of this scroll existing, and so it is a true secret to be held by only the supreme leader of this most hidden chapter. Despite its secrecy, we do know of its purpose. If we are to see the Grey Knights as the final bastion to deter the forces of the warp, then the Terminus Decree can be seen in a similar way, in that it is to be the final response to be used when humanity faces its cataclysmic end. When we are locked in our final battle, and when there appears to be no light to save us from the eternal gloaming, then the Supreme Grandmaster is to finally unearth this sacred and damned artifact where he will bring it to life. It is unknown as to whether or not this will actually pull humanity out from the dark, or if it will simply drown the entire galaxy, ensuring that none may pick upon the corpses of man or live amongst these blasted stars. But regardless of its true function, it is only the Grey Knights who could ever be trusted to hold such a weapon, for their infallible nature means that they will never be corrupted or tempted to deploy this tool to further some nefarious goal. There long existed many hushed whispers and rumors regarding its function. Some thought that it may possibly summon a fifth Chaos God, and that this being would purge the entirety of the warp before forever sealing it in an explosion which would devastate the known universe. Others believe that the scroll serves a far simpler function and that it instructs the reader on how to terminate the ancient golden throne, condemning the God Emperor of mankind to death. This would free his trapped soul, and it is said that he would then be free to roam the galaxy, where he could expunge the many enemies of man, bringing humanity once more into a new golden age. For the longest time, this was presumed to be the most likely outcome of the decree. The golden seal of the archaic wooden box is said to be completely unique across the galaxy, apart from a single twin, which is to be found within the deepest machinery of the Golden Throne itself. As such, it would make sense to think that perhaps this scroll has some relation to the Emperor's own seat, but for now this shall remain as but a rumor. With all this in mind, I shall tell of a third theory, and I will let you decide on what you believe the Terminus Decree to cause. 
It is said that in the chaotic times of the Horus heresy, that a rogue scientist known as Basilio Fo had produced a phage virus which would instantly kill any Astartes or Primarch who contracted the disease. This secretive weapon is said to have been copied with the Terminus Decree containing the instructions on how to deploy it across the galaxy, utterly exterminating the entirety of the Adeptus Astartes from the stars. Let it be known that Basilio Fo had an ardent hatred of Horus and of the Astartes in general, but it would not be so outside of the realm of possibility for this phage virus to also lead to the deaths of non-Astartes as well. In any case, its deployment would certainly lead to a period of unmatched chaos within the galaxy. Mankind has ever been defended by the forces of the Space Marines, and their deaths would not go unnoticed by our many rivals who ever seek our downfall. If this is indeed what is inscribed within the Terminus Decree, then it would undoubtedly lead to the death of our Imperium. For even with the strength of men, it is angels who watch over us during this darkest of nights. From the deepest of trenches, we now must crane our necks and look to the tallest of peaks. Atop the highest of spires, which jut out from the ice and strain into the night sky, we will find the Augurium. This structure is the home to the individuals known as prognosticars, who spend their days laboring about the strange dancing lights, which reflect and shine off of the many mirrored walls of this esoteric spire. The prognosticars are some of the most highly specialized of psychers to be found throughout the entire Imperium, and their purpose has been deemed as being utterly essential to the operations of the Grey Knights. These psionic adepts are incredibly sensitive to the shifting currents of the warp, and they can detect even the smallest fluctuations in its strange tidal flows from near any point within the galaxy. Some scholars have spent many a night agonizing over several bottles of Amasek, questioning as to whether or not a prognosticar is more sensitive to the tumultuous waves of the warp than of perhaps even the great navigators who steer the barges of the Imperial Navy. But alas, we will likely never know who holds that crown. No matter the answer, Possessing this highly skilled cadre of psionic acolytes has provided the Grey Knights with the ability to detect even the smallest of demonic outbreaks from anywhere across the vast expanse of space. If even a single warp-born creature begins clawing and pushing up against the thin barrier between our world and the next, then the prognosticars will sense this threat, and they will send a warning to the great company captains who will most always place a preventative task force on high alert, ready to respond to a potential crisis. It may seem unnecessary to deploy an entire army of the venerable Grey Knights to fend off a single demon, but it is from the gifts of the prognosticars that tells of how serious a threat each incursion may pose. That one demon may seem meek, but if it was to escape, then who can predict of the torment and terror that it may bring? Perhaps it would go on to desecrate a temple and rip open a warp portal large enough to damn the entire world, or even the entire star sector. For this reason, the Grey Knights must always respond to each potential danger based on the foretelling of their prognosticars, for it is only from their warp site that we may predict of how serious the demonic outbreak could be. It is tragic, but sometimes necessary for innocents to die during this banishment process. The Grey Knights take no pleasure in killing the humble and ignorant citizens of the Imperium, but oftentimes the deaths of the few will save the lives of the many. For example, imagine for but a moment of a farmhand who begins to experience strange hallucinations of unknown voices speaking out to his very soul. 
A symptom such as this has only one cure, and sadly, it is to be found in the depths of an inquisitorial jail cell. But if the Grey Knights were not called, then that worker could make a most grievous mistake and respond to the estranged voices, leading to a demonic outbreak of such a scale that an entire world would be forced to meet its demise. From this, we must ask ourselves a question of morals. Should we indeed resolve to bring about the deaths of the innocent if it means that others may be saved from a far more terrible fate? Thankfully, we ourselves do not need to answer that question, for it is the forces of the Grey Knights who must shoulder that burden. We must be forever grateful for their actions, for the weight of condemning a billion souls to their deaths is not one which can be taken lightly, and the stain upon one's soul for having exterminated untold millions of families is one which can never be wiped clean. With these previous chambers and rooms, it may seem that the Citadel is a most cold and unloving of places. Whilst you may be correct in that assessment, there is one location where this is certainly not the case, and it would be the Hall of Champions. Within the Fortress Monastery, this is to be the home of the fabled warrior coven, known as the Paladins. If the purifiers are knights who have achieved a sense of absolute purity within their hearts, then the paladins should be seen as those who have arisen as the most noble and elite of warriors who are utterly unmatched in their combative and tactical prowess. There are none in the chapter who can match the martial ability of a paladin, and they exemplify the militaristic side of their demon-banishing skill set more so than any other. In any case, the Hall of Champions is eternally inhabited by these paladins who study and hone their abilities under the watchful eye of their fallen brothers. The reason I say this is because the Hall is lined with marble statues of every paladin captain and grandmaster to have ever risen to this rank, and it is from their glory which inspires the future generations of paladins to push themselves towards a new plane of victory. In addition to these effigies, the hall is also the home to some of the greatest of relics of the chapter. Banners, belonging both to the forces of the Imperium and to its enemies, hang from the tall rafters as a reminder of the eternal war which mankind must face. Trophies, artifacts and prizes from all across the galaxy are also kept here, where they adorn great scones and racks, allowing all to bask in their magnanimous sight. To stand in this chamber is to witness the historic trail of victories left by the Grey Knights. You will see skulls from enemies killed during the earliest days of their chapter by the original Grandmasters, who assisted Malkador in putting together this formidable force. There will be prized trophies stolen from the greatest of foes who at one point threatened to topple the entire galaxy, and yet they now simply stand as a symbol of the might and capability of the Grey Knights. The actual hall itself is so pristine and so littered with these trophies that the chapter will hold its great feasts here allowing all to witness the glory of their brothers, past and present. Even if one is not a paladin, they may walk through the hall, for if it inspires them to work harder and push themselves further, then that is all to be for humanity's great benefit. At this point, some of you may be questioning the relics which are on display, for if the Grey Knights most commonly fight against demons, then we must ask whether or not the artifacts here bear some trace of demonic energy. Whilst, yes, some of them will harbour a memory of evil, but the most dangerous of recovered relics will be kept in great buried chambers and vaults, kept behind warding runes to prevent their taint from ever reaching out to corrupt the rest of the citadel. 
But there is one exception to this rule. In the ancient past of the Grey Knights, they were once embroiled in an incredibly costly campaign within an otherworldly pocket of unreality known as the Ib World Maze. Though it involved a tremendous undertaking, the knights eventually ended this incursion by defeating the commanding Hellspawn, who was known as Iremnath, the demon Raja of Nalu. Because of the catastrophic losses suffered through this mission, the paladins were not content to simply banish this demon, and even granting it with the gift of true death seemed to be an insufficient punishment. As such, the charred skull of the demon was retained, with the still sentient and living essence of the never-born being trapped within, forever bound to stare out from its blackened eyes but never able to act or influence the world around it. This skull, now formed into a jail to the foul demon, has been suspended above the throne of the Grand Master within this hall, and so it is forced to eternally bear witness to the glorious celebrations of the very chapter which has forever chained and shackled its unholy spirit. Within the Great Citadel, it is inevitable that we would find a room dedicated towards containing the combined knowledge and experience of the venerable chapter, and it would be known as the Sanctum Sanctorum. Some have equated this chamber as being the beating heart of the Grey Knights, since all will at some point need to draw from its great annals to ascend through the ranks and become a more complete version of the warriors which Malkador always hoped that they could be. The actual librariums here are perhaps the finest within the entire Imperium, and although you would not be able to compare it to the contents of the Eldari Black Library, it is certainly unmatched within the realm of real space. There are untold thousands of ancient tomes collected from mankind's earliest past, containing the vast records of our archaic history, predating that of even the dark age of technology. In addition, Personal journals and diaries from some of the greatest of historical figures have been collected here, which scholars and battle brothers can delve into to learn of that which made these individuals so capable. The most fascinating of these journals is incomplete, but it is said that the Grey Knights hold a series of pages written by the God Emperor himself, which contains his records and accounts of his venerable life. Aside from these books which have been written by outside authors, a great deal of the contents of this library was produced by the Grey Knights themselves, and they focus on the great arts of their psionic abilities and of how to best banish the demon kin. Some of these tomes are thousands of pages long, and yet describe only a single spell or ritual, which itself will only be effective against one specific type of demonic entity, which has not been encountered in our galaxy for several millennia. But it is knowledge which simply cannot be lost. Other books will be more focused on the technological artifacts of the Grey Knights. Their nemesis force weapons and psi rounds are only produced for their own chapter, and the secrets for fabricating these relics are closely held secrets which will never be shared with the wider Imperium. Other sacred tools, such as warding amulets or grenades, which may anchor a point of reality against breaking under the weight of the warp, will also have their schematics and purification rituals enshrined within the ancient tomes. Only a select few of these will be shared with the tech priests of Daimos, who have been trusted to act as the sole manufacturers for the various relics to this chapter. Some of the more valuable of schematics will be kept within the ranks of the Grey Knight Tech Marines, but we will speak more of this agreement later on in the sermon. Aside from these tomes and scrolls, there is one region of the Sanctum which is held under a different level of reverence, and it would be the Librarium Demonica. 
In here resides the combined wealth of knowledge collected from across the galaxy regarding the various machinations and forces of the warp. Many of the ancient bookshelves and cabinets are thousands of years old themselves and have almost folded inwards from the sheer weight of the leather-bound books which have been endlessly stacked atop them. It is the job of the many scribes and scholars to maintain these archives, for if even a single scroll in here is lost, then it could prove to be the undoing of countless worlds, for the secrets entombed upon its parchment may have very well been the saving grace which prevented a galaxy-splitting demonic incursion from appearing. But with that being said, it is only the most honoured and loyal of non-Astartes individuals who would ever be trusted within these sanctified halls. To even enter the librarium is a task which few can safely perform. The chamber itself is blocked behind a bulwark of three sets of adamantium walls, each of which have been inscribed and imbued with thousands of archaic spells, some of which exist as the final remaining legacy of languages long since made extinct across the galaxy. These preventative measures were orchestrated by Malkador the Sigilite himself, and they were designed to prevent any force from ever being able to break their way into this most sacred of libraries. Rather than simply barging through, however, we will be civil and follow through the proper channels to enter this hallowed sanctorum. The first entrance portal exists as a blast door, locked behind dozens of intricate, ever-shifting ciphers whose solution should be known to only those graced with permission to enter this hall. Behind this is a second entrance enshrouded as a spatial displacement field, which will reject and eviscerate any who cannot navigate its anomalous cloud. Finally, one must pass through a magical vortex guarded by a senior librarian who will assess your rights to enter, and if he deems you as unworthy, then he will simply banish your soul to the warp, where you will die a most painful death. But once you have entered, then you will be in the company of only the truest of scholarly companions who have earned the right to delve into the most forbidden tomes, all in the endless pursuit of knowledge. The various texts and scrolls of the Inquisition have been collected and assembled in this chamber, and one could spend a thousand lifetimes poring over each specific aspect of demonology without even becoming a master in the subject. The ancient tomes, some of which abound in leathers collected from the hellish hides of demons themselves, are in no way safe for an untrained individual to handle. Some of these books have been stored here because they contain several errant wisps which have become trapped within the crumbling pages, and to even open it for but the briefest instant would put the entire citadel at risk of these spirits escaping. Other tomes have bound demons within their very writing, and as the long years have caused the text to fade, the hellspawn are poised to break free, only to trap the soul of the reader alongside them as another pained sentence of abject horror. But for those who have a need to study these novels, they will find an unmatched bounty of knowledge within their pages. Every known secret of the warp has been recorded in some capacity across this hall, and if one needs to seal a great portal to end an incursion, then they must only delve into this sanctum to discover the antidote of the demon. Additionally, Methods for summoning forth the various magics and powers of the warp are also contained in these scrolls. Any psyker across the galaxy, whether they be but a humble astropath or a chief librarian of an Astartes chapter, will find their methods or techniques somewhere in this chamber, but they would likely be rather unnerved by the fact that dispulsion and counter-magical methods are also written alongside each power. Much of the knowledge found within these books will also be contained within the relics known as the Liber Demonicum, 
These are small, leather-bound tomes which each Grey Knight will carry, and they are to be seen as not only a symbol of their loyalty to their chapter, but it is also a useful reference guide for how to best combat the various forces of the warp. While small, if you were to open this book, instead of typical pages, you would find a series of nano-thin screens which can be sorted through and interacted with to quickly find the required piece of knowledge. From here, a knight can look up instructions on how to defeat esoteric demons, or of which incantation should be used to close a warp portal spawned from a specific demon prince. One of the most prized aspects of this book will be that it contains the complete repertoire of the known true names of many of the denizens of the warp. A true name will bind a hellspawn to their patron god, and knowing of this secret will allow the speaker to banish destroy or rebind the demon to serve their own will. It is important to note here that the instructions listed within its pages are not to be read for one who is faint of heart. Aside from the various strategies for combating some of the most heinous and depraved of demons, it also contains a step-by-step -step playbook on how to react to heretical uprisings and of when innocents will be forced to die to prevent an outbreak. This has been known to include instructions on when to cleanse a small town or of when a situation seems desperate enough to destroy an entire hive city, all to prevent the spread of forces who may call forth a demonic incursion. The final option listed within these pages would be of when to enact the decree of exterminatus and to condemn an entire world to meet its fiery end. But it is for the betterment of man that we produce martyrs to safeguard our collective souls. If a grey knight suspects their allied forces of having been overexposed to the forces of the warp, or if the stench of heresy permeates from a ruling force captain of a loyalist chapter, then they may consult this book to find an appropriate response for such a crime. Sadly, it often reads that one should simply expunge the taint of treachery with extreme prejudice, but we must remember that there can be no mercy shown to the enemies of man who willingly consort with the hell spawn of the warp. Given that the Sanctum Sanctorum is one of the most highly protected and hidden of places for the Grey Knights, it would make sense for this to be the home to some of the more questionable or heretical of artefacts. Deep within the inner chambers of this most shrouded of rooms, we will find a single alcove in which exists the Vault of the Labyrinths. This hidden dwelling is kept within a field of stasis, ensuring that none can enter to tamper with its delicate machinations, but more importantly, so that none may escape from its ancient wardings. For you see, the Grey Knights do not simply see this area as yet another storage space for their many relics. Instead, they use it as a prison this place is sealed to time itself, and once a spirit has been condemned to their sentencing here, then there is truly no escape, and they will remain here indefinitely until the end of the universe itself. This is to be seen as no ordinary jail cell, for within the archaic vault, we will find row upon row of artifacts known as tesseract labyrinths. These are relatively small pieces of technology which would fit in the palm of your hand, and yet their arcane workings are able to imprison the very strongest of demons for a limitless eternity. An important point to note here is that there are several theories regarding the true origins to these tesseract labyrinths. Some will claim that they are in fact relics of the antediluvian necrons, 
and that it was none other than Trazin the Infinite who graced the Inquisition with a select few of these gifts in recognition of their fervent interest in cataloguing and recording the various rarities of the galaxy. Others, however, will scoff at this xenophilia, and they will state that the vaults are in fact relics of Malkador, who himself designed and fabricated their mysterious workings. Regardless of their artisanal production, however, the Grey Knights do not have an endless supply of these tools, and so they are to only be used when a Grand Master or high-ranking Inquisitor deems it as being of the utmost importance to the entire Imperium. As I have stated, using a Tesseract Labyrinth will trap a demon for an eternity, and from this prison there is truly no escape. There is no fate more terrible or more feared than captivity for the spirits of the warp, and this isolation is seen as something which must be avoided at all possible costs. Even though their otherworldly essence may be mighty, there are none who are known to endure an infinite sentence without suffering from some cracks upon their psyche. Their directionless energies will simply melt away until any sense of identity or personality is naught but a field of errant madness which can only be conscious of its own torment. Unlike their sentencing, however, this is not a permanent affliction. An inquisitor may choose to partially open a vault, at which point the latent spirit will coalesce once more into its prior form. You may be wondering why an agent of the Imperium would ever choose to free such a terrible demon, but you must remember that those within the Inquisition work in ever so mysterious ways. Perhaps the Inquisitor wishes to interrogate the foul spirit, or to forever bind it to another artifact where its immaterial energies may fuel some rare weapon for the benefit of all mankind. It is no small feat to capture and contain a demon by this method, and in fact, there are only a few dozen vaults which contain an ensnared hellspawn within them. Rather sadly, it is primarily effective against the lesser demons of the warp, with there being only a single recorded instance of a greater demon ever being captured. This may be seen as somewhat comical to some of you, since we must ask if there is any point in capturing a single bubbling nurgling, for what benefit could possibly be gained from interrogating such a mindless creature? Well, you see, the fact that the Grey Knights can contain any demon through this method shows that the concept itself is sound, and so if we theoretically had enough Tesseract Labyrinths, then we could potentially contain the entire populace of the warp with these tools. It may seem ludicrous to aspire towards such a goal, but thus far it is one of the few methods which has been discovered to utterly contain a demon, and so it must be pursued, for it could prove to save humanity in its distant future. It will not be easy to follow through with this goal, however, as I have stated, the Grey Knights only possess a scant few of these relics, and because of the sheer impossibility of their inner workings, not even the most senior of tech priests have been able to decipher a method for recreating their mechanical majesty. Because of this, we cannot replicate or produce new vaults, and so for now they exist as a most precious of resource, which the Grey Knights will do anything to preserve. Situated in the central cavity of the Great Citadel, kept equidistant to the tallest spires of the Augurium and of the deepest depths of the Chambers of Purity, we will find a room which contains one of the greatest treasures of the Grey Knights. This chamber contains a technological artifact known as the Warp Nexus, and it exists as one of the great many gifts left by Malkador to protect his young chapter. As many of you may know, during the final battle of the Soul System during the climactic hours of the Horus Heresy, Malkador plunged the entire moon of Titan 
into the hellscape of the warp, where it could remain shrouded from the all-encompassing chaos of the Great Solar War. Though his own psychic magics were potent enough to complete this ritual, his monumental capacity for psionics was soon to be required upon Holy Terror, and so he created the machineries in this room as a way of ensuring that the moon would forever be safe from the tides of the warp, even if he himself was not able to oversee its protection. Whilst its esoteric workings are almost completely unknown to most of the Imperium, we can piece together some aspects of its functioning to learn of its current role for the chapter. Essentially, this nexus will anchor the spatial and temporal positioning of Titan within both real space and within the warp. This means that even with the erratic changes in time and space which exist within the Immaterium, that Titan would ever be able to reappear around its Saturnite orbit, once again rejoining its solar companions. It also projected a shield which would protect the moon from any incursions of demonic forces, which would naturally be eager to pluck the vibrant souls of man who became lost within the flow of the warp. Rather sadly, as we are all well aware, Malkador the Sigilite perished upon the Golden Throne, and with his death, the true methods for operating this occult nexus were lost along with him. None within the Grey Knights are sure of how to maintain or activate the mystic tool, and so they are relegated to performing ancient sacraments and rituals in order to preserve its sanctity against the ever-present marching of time. There is to be a constant stationing of 200 serfs who will endlessly chant and pray towards the Nexus. And it is through their efforts that supposedly appease the ancient machine. There are two main reasons as to why the Grey Knights have chosen to preserve this relic. The first being that since it is an artifact of Malkador, that it is a near divine symbol of their founder, and so they have a reverential duty behind maintaining its unknowable workings. The second, more tangible reason, however, is that should the chapter ever require it, they will be able to once again plunge their moon into the chaos of the warp, where they will be protected from the calamitous events occurring within real space. As I have stated, though, none within the chapter are quite sure of how to operate the various pentagramic seals and runic projections, so they are currently unable to fully restore the functionality of this ancient relic. Furthermore, the magics and rituals which went into producing such an artifact were so archaic themselves that it is doubtful for any within the chapter to ever fully decipher their inner workings, so it may very well remain in a dormant state for the rest of time. This is not to say that it serves no function, however, for even while the machine rests, it can still flare into action as a shadow of its former self. As it stands today, the limited operation of the warp nexus means that Titan forever exists in a state where it is almost between the planes of reality. Though, yes, it is indeed present within the realm of real space, we can almost imagine it as holding one foot in the warp, ever ready to dive in once more, where it will withstand the crashing flows of the Immaterium, all thanks to the grace of Malkador. Not every area of the great citadel of Titan is dedicated towards the living members of their chapter. We must now turn our attention to those who have fallen in their mission of defending the humble worlds of man, as they will have been laid to rest within the dead fields. Every grey knight, once they ascend into the ranks of their chapter, knows that they will one day die in battle against the malign hellspawn of the warp. And yet, there is some comfort to be found in knowing that they will have a place to rest alongside their battle brothers. 
This area, filled with the endless crypts and mausoleums, is seen as being one of the most hallowed places upon Titan, for it is where the bodies of each knight will be left to slumber in peace, knowing that they have given everything to the Imperium. Every single member of their chapter, from the very first founders to the very last recruits, will have a place within these fields, and their great deeds and memories will be forever immortalized here so that none may forget their actions. In addition to their recorded legacy, a relief of their likeness will be sculpted in marble, lit by the azure flames which ever illuminate this most sacred of places. Rather sadly, however, due to the terrible nature of their duty, sometimes the body of a grey knight will be lost to the warp and their bones will be condemned to isolation, bereft of the presence of their brothers. In these cases, where a recovery is simply impossible, then the memories of that night will not be forgotten, and they will still have a place within the consecrated fields. For these heroes, their names and deeds will be carved into a vast wall of basalt, and there they will forever live on in the memories of those who reflect upon the great losses sustained by their chapter. Within these fields, we will also find the great tomb of the eight. It is here where the vast sarcophagi of the eight founding grand masters of the Grey Knights have been put to memory. Though the ancient scrolls of history do not tell us of the true identities or fates of these individuals, their deeds and actions as the pioneering leaders to this most necessary of chapters will ever be remembered upon these towering mausoleums. Now that we have a keen understanding of the citadel itself, let us look upwards towards the night sky to see of the various auxiliary facilities which support the functioning of Titan. The first to mention would be the Broadsword Station. This star base hovers in a geostationary position high above the fortress monastery, and it primarily acts as a defensive bastion and port for the immense fleets of the Grey Knights. I will first mention the immense defensive capabilities of this station, for they are matched by only the finest of orbital bastions which exist throughout the Imperium. The colossal structure is a true bulwark, being enclosed within layer after layer of thick adamantium, ceramite and plasteel, all of which have been arranged in such a way that huge portions of the station can be destroyed without damaging the overall integrity or functionality of the remaining portions. In addition, it has been outfitted with endless rows of heavy torpedo emplacements, railguns and laser cannons, all of which are potent enough to reduce even light cruisers down to hulks of molten slag. The immense power generators of this station also project an impenetrable void shield around the structure which can withstand even the combined weapon salvos of entire enemy fleets. But aside from these capabilities, it is the dockyards and fleets of the Grey Knights which truly make the Broadsword Station so special. Most within the Imperium have no true knowledge of the demon hunting chapter, but if they could see their fleet for but a moment, then it would surely inspire a mix of fervent admiration and burning jealousy. For you see, the ships which are under the command of the knights are simply some of the finest to have ever been constructed by the great forge world of Deimos. Their engines and thrusters are unmatched in their speeds and the combined firepower which they may levy is truly awe-inspiring. In addition to their material strengths, the Navi's nobility have also provided the Grey Knights with their most skilled of navigators, meaning that the ships may be piloted with a level of experience that is truly outshone by none other within the galaxy. To further enhance their capabilities, strange and esoteric facilities have been constructed within the helms of these ships, which emit potent runic charms to augment the pathfinding abilities of the navigators. 
With all of these specialized components, however, comes a great cost. Each deployment is a significant burden to these ancient relics of machinery, and so the maintenance tasks required to restore them to active duty can take several years, with untold laborers dying during the arduous process. But this is a cost which the Grey Knights will readily bear. The final auxiliary facility which I shall mention is somewhat grander than that of a simple shipyard and it would be the Forge World of Deimos. This moon, once suspended within the orbit of Mars, was seized by the Grey Knights during their inception as it was ordained that the chapter would require their own Forge World, kept separate from the rest of the Mechanicus. It is somewhat unknown of how an entire moon was silently relocated, and these are secrets which were likely lost along the long march of time, but we can safely assume that it was done through the use of ancient and forbidden tools likely sourced from the dark ages of technology. In any case, Deimos now has a new home and purpose. The tech priests and acolytes of the Steel Forge have but one task, and it is to produce the arms, armaments, and tools of the Grey Knights. This partnership between the two organizations, whilst fruitful, is locked in a most curious position. The Grey Knights see it as a matter of necessity to work with the tech priests. However, they are pained to reveal their secrets to any but themselves and so they will only share the most basic of schematics needed for the fabrication of their equipment. The Mechanicus similarly do not wish to reveal their own methods to the Knights, and so they too will keep much of their operation shrouded, revealing only the bare minimum of what they can in order to maintain their positive relations. This creates an odd situation where much of the interactions between the two factions is not performed between emissaries, but rather messages will be passed along through lobotomized servitors who will have their feeble minds wiped clean as soon as their relay has been sent. This may seem like naught but paranoia to some of you, but you must remember that the secrets which are to be divulged by the Grey Knights often relate to the hellish forces of the warp, and so it is imperative for them to protect this knowledge at all costs. With the schematics and plans in place, Deimos will fire up its great forges, belching forth thick smogs and pollutants into the sky, which coalesce into occlusive clouds, before finally breaking into a deluge of acidic rains. Within their manufactorums, endless belts of sirons are produced. Great arcane tools for banishing demons will be consecrated, and specialized armors will be plated onto the many tanks and vehicles of the chapter. Some of the equipment used by the Grey Knights has been ordained as being too precious to share with the Mechanicus, and so there will still be a limited manufactorum upon the Citadel of Titan, which is tasked with producing these relics. Nemesis Force weapons, as well as some other more forbidden tools, will only be fabricated by the Tech Marines and Inquisitorial staff who reside upon Titan, as they cannot conscionably share these secrets with any but the chapter's own. This shall bring us to the end of our sermon. As you can clearly see, the great citadel of Titan is a sprawling fortress, in which the forces of the Grey Knights endlessly toil away in order to hone their skills in the art of demon slaying. There are few places within the Imperium which could compare to the magnitude of their home, and even the vast fortress monasteries of fellow Space Marine chapters will pale in comparison to the unmatched capabilities and facilities held within their hallowed depths. Under the watchful direction of the Grand Masters, the Grey Knights will continue in their mission, granted by the Emperor himself, and it is to scour the galaxy of any trace of warp-born demons wherever they are to be encountered. 
Dearest citizens, I hope that this has been an elucidating tale into the secrets of this most mysterious of chapters. In the near future, I pray that you will return to hear of more stories. But for now, I bid you all a pleasant farewell.